Hey guys. Hey, um, hope y'all are okay. I'm good. It's been the longest minute since been all up in it, and I can't even think of it night for this shit. I literally had to listen to a previous podcast to check if I had a specific intro that I'm thinking about. Yeah. It's like those primer days when you when we closed school for so long you forgot your own handwriting, so like that was totally me. Anyhow, I'm back. I'm back, I'm back, I'm back. Today we'll take a bit of a detour, and uh, I really hope this is correct usage of the word detour. Um, so this will not be the usual episode where I bitch about people's work. Shame. Um, it'll be a sad one, but hopefully one that's uplifting in the end. Hopefully. Uh, so on the 1st of July, 2020, year of our Lord, an year of intense, inexplicable agony, I attended a burial. It was for a baby. His name was Graham. He was about one year and six months old. And he was killed by capitalism. I've known his mom for a long time now. Uh, my sister and I used to tuition her and her sister when they were in high school and primary school respectively. We were both much older than that than they were. I was in campus and my sister was newly working. And that was our way of sort of giving back. They were poor, we were not. Um, in those days, I still believed that individual effort, hard work, greed, and all that jazz was what it took to succeed and get out of poverty. I thought if they just study and pass, they'll get good jobs and break the cycle of poverty. I felt, I felt sorry for them. Uh, but in the way you feel sorry for somebody who doesn't know better and therefore can't do better. But here I was. I was going to play my part through tutoring them so they would know better, do better, and have amazing lives down the road. I cringe at the thought of what I must have said to them in those days. I know it must have been stuff like, you see the good lives other people are living? You could live that life. You just have to work hard and get good grades and you'll get a good job. And then you can live a good life. The unspoken bit was... Then you live like us. You live like me. What had I done to live the good life I was living then? I'd made the smart choice of being expelled from the loins of parents who had money. Go me. I mean, God. I mean, old me just just makes me cringe. <laughs> One day we'll talk about how I once told a friend of mine who had terrible menstrual cramps. That Jesus cancelled all of that on the cross, which is why my sister and I, who believe in grace, don't suffer those bad cramps. So yeah, anyway, let's just deal with one faux pas at the time. Fast forward a few years, I'm still living in my parents' house with three adorable cats. The girls we tutored, well, all of them have children out of wedlock. None of them have jobs. All of them are living absolutely poor and I guess one could even say miserable. The one who lost her baby, let's call her C. She works as a house cleaner. When I'm incredibly lazy and I've piled up dishes so high the women in my village would chastise me by saying no man would marry me, I call her. She takes care of my problem for me and then I agonize over how much to pay her so that I'm not taking advantage of her and being the exploitative capitalist I abhor. She has a meal. We talk about her kids, her siblings, her mom in the most perfunctionary way, and then I pay her. She leaves, and my sanctuary is restored. Until next time. She does this for some many years to. A week before the 1st of July, she called me. And she said, I came to Tongwa Miaga. And I can't think of her voice without tearing up. It was just, pain and heartbreak for words and I can't even hear them. I came to Dongwa Miaga. So I called her back and she said she thinks it was pneumonia, that her baby was cold, had breathing difficulties and, and uh, had also been coughing. She said he'd been sick for a few days but she thought he was going to be- to get better. 
She couldn't afford to take him to a hospital. She said he died in her arms. Later when we spoke after the burial, she said her other two children, both under 10, in that moment, that morning he had died in her arms, cried and cried. And one of them prayed and prayed. And when she told me about the praying part, I wanted to cry and cry and cry. So we went for the burial that morning of July 1st. 15 people. That's all the people who were there to bury this baby. Eight men, seven women, four of the women, four of the men were pastors. Her mom was the only immediate family member. There was an uncle, her grandfather. That's it. And the rest was us. And I wanted to cry again. Her father was missing. Her baby's father was missing. Her siblings were missing. Later when we congregated at her house and I asked why her brother who I knew was around was not present, one of her sisters said his boss wouldn't give him the day off to mourn with his sister and bury her baby. And I know this person's boss. I can know the establishment, I know the shop where he works. At the burial site, because it was just 15 of us, we all got a chance to say something. And everybody talked about how we were at the cemetery and how people die and everybody will die and that C should take heart and be strong because of that. And all I could think was, even if the whole world fucking dies, they're not your baby. People's babies die every day. But they're not your baby. They talked about how God was using Graham's death. <laughs> calling him home. In order to remind us in this corona times. To turn to him. To set our lives right. In the light of eternity. And I wondered. What kind of God has such limited, pathetic capabilities that he kills a baby, gravely wounds a mother, to communicate something so easily communicated a million different ways? The pastor, the main pastor of the day, among the four, scared us with a sermon about hellfire and damnation for the unprepared, and it was all I could do not to roll my eyes. My mouth I said free, you know, because face mask. But my eyes, I had to manage that. Turns out I wasn't successful at that, because way afterwards, after the burial, and during a heavy lunch, the pastor was sent by God to ask me about the word he shared and what stuck with me. To which I replied, I do not believe in the Bible. Which made him the most closest to God, Pastor, at present, because God exposed me to him and not to the rest, so should make it to the rest of the pastors, Galenia. Then it was time to bury the baby. After the sermon, we walked in almost a single file among other little graves. Of 2019 to 2020, 2020 to 2020, grave markers on them, following our little coffin. They put the coffin in the ground. We buried him. Then, because they had no money for flowers, we plucked wild weeds and stacked them on the little grave. And I watched see, I watched her face expressionless as she stuck several little branches of weeds on her baby's grave. And when she didn't cry, I cried for her. And that's when I realized there would be no grave marker 
for our baby. They didn't have money for it. We buried Graham in what was essentially an unmarked grave. An unmarked grave. I didn't even know that could happen. How do you come back? How do you know where you put your baby? And then we left. We just left. We went to see his house. She lives in a Mabati that's iron shit structure for my imaginary non Kenyan listeners. It's a school office, but because of COVID 19 and school closure, that's where she lives now. And it was cold. It was so cold, I kept rubbing my arms to warm myself up. And I thought of baby Graham in that cold, cold house. It was around two or three in the afternoon and so cold, it may as well have been the wee hours of the morning. I looked at where Graham last lived and I thought we killed him. Capitalism killed him. Poverty killed him. And in that moment, I understood why all the religious people present, which was everyone but me, wanted to keep talking about God loving Graham and taking him home. Because if you allow yourself to consider the fact that he died because his mom could not afford decent housing, a warm house, a heater, you lose your goddamn mind. You do the sort of things that end with you being killed by the state. Because that burial should have been a protest. Every burial like it should lead to an insurrection. It should be a rallying cry to revolt and rebel. Everyone I know who's had, who's had a baby has a heater. It's so obvious. Or maybe it's not. That lived in that cold, cold Mabati house for just a month. She had just gotten kicked out of her old house because of rent arrears. One month in a cold, cold house and he was dead. <laughs> Explain to me how his death is God's demonstration of love. The day after the burial, I wake up to what was clearly an invigorating chat in my Chama WhatsApp group. Someone had posted a quote. The cost of success, late nights, early mornings, very few friends, being misunderstood, feeling overwhelmed, questioning your sanity, being your own cheerleader. But guess what? Don't give up. It's worth it. And everyone was talking about how legit and on the money the court was. The point being, if you're not successful, it's your fault. You just wouldn't get off your lazy ass and pay the price for success. The logical conclusion being, it is Cyprian's fault that she lived in a cold, cold house that killed her baby. So basically, Cyprian, by her unwillingness to make the sacrifices necessary to secure proper housing and access to health care for her baby, killed her baby. So she killed her baby. She killed her son. The people in my channel group, they deserve the good life they're living. And C deserves hers. Both apparently aware they are by the sweat of their brow. What level of privilege to be able to think that without any cognitive dissonance. The complete unwillingness to see all the ways in which you have been fortunate. The ways in which you have been lucky where other people have not. What ignorance, what selfishness, what blindness. How can you, 
a fully grown adult failed to see the structural and systemic factors at play that function to knock and keep people down. How can you look at the world and think, oh, I have what I deserve, and those who don't have shit are there because that's what they deserve? How do you become so callous and hardened and merciless? How? What scares me most about this woman in my channel group is, and, and the fact that this is their worldview, is that most of them are inclined to serving in the community and making a difference in society. But how do you make a difference when you believe that you have earned what you have and therefore so has everyone else? How, you, how do you make a difference if you can't see all the ways in which the systems are exploiting people? How can you make a difference when you're basically propping up a capitalist system that demands everything of you, body and soul, all your time and energy, just in order to make a living? How can you act like there's nothing abnormal and unjust about a system that forces you to sacrifice everything? just to barely get by. What is this if not apologetics for capitalism and exploitation of workers and everyone else in general? What is this if not gaslighting the poor and vulnerable? I'll close with three quotes. In Outliers, Malcolm Gladwell dispels the myth of individual effort and success. He says the tallest oak in the forest is the tallest, not just because it grew from the hardiest acorn. It's the tallest because no other trees blocked its sunlight. The soil around it was deep and rich. No rabbit chewed through its bark as a sapling, and no lumberjack cut it down before it matured. We all know that successful people come from sturdy seeds, but do we know about the sunlight that warmed them? The soil in which they put down the roots and the rabbits and lumberjacks they were lucky enough to avoid. Kianga Yamata Taylor and From Black Lives Matter to Black Liberation says the essence of economic inequality is born out of a simple fact. There are 400 billionaires in the United States and 45 million people living in poverty. These are not parallel facts. There are 400 American billionaires because there are 45 million people living in poverty. Profit comes at the expense of the living wage. Corporate executives, university presidents, and capitalists in general are living the good life because so many others are living a life of hardship. The final quote is from MLK Jr. He says, and one day we must ask the question, why are there 40 million poor people in America? And when you begin to ask that question, you are raising questions about the economic system, about a broader distribution of wealth. When you ask that question, you begin to question the capitalist economy. That's... Um, that's it on that, and um, hopefully now to what I think is the uplifting part, which, you know, really may not be. <sighs> There's a march slash a protest set for Tuesday, 7th of July, Saba Saba, and I'm conflicted. Right, I want to go. I do. But I'm so scared. I'm scared I may get arrested, hurt, maybe even killed. I'm scared. <laughs> it's funny and uh, maybe a little scary uh, that when I thought of the possibility of being killed, the first thing I thought about was my cats and how they'll have no one to take care of them like I do. And I thought this must be what people with kids think about. 
and they, and so they sit out all risky civil engage, civic engagement. But then I thought, number one, that's where they want us. They want us scared. And number two, if you're a parent, do you really want your kids to live in a world like this one? So I'll go. Right? I'll go because other people are scared too, and they will go. I'll go because Graham died. The system killed him. And someone should at least stand up and say no. Enough. The much as people's way of speaking out against a broken system without universal health care, with rising unemployment, rampant police brutality, homelessness complete with state sanctioned evictions. People are starving and have no access to clean water. While our rulers and overseers could not possibly be living it up any more than they currently are. Spotting bullshit about BBI and 2022 succession while fighting to kiss my guys as daily on what passes for news in this country. <laughs> I watched Chris Hedges and, uh, and Roger Harlan from Extinction Rebellion in conversation. And they kept coming back to what it means to live a good life, a life of meaning. Uh, I'll play you uh, uh, one of my favorite parts of the clip in closing. And uh, you should you should go listen to it in its entire dates. It's beautiful. They talk about how it's not about being practical. It's about doing what's right. Yeah, I love that quote. I use it so much, I've had to stop using it because I could see, like, I'd get in front of an audience and they kind of mouth it along with me, although I do think it's great. And I did steal it from Sartre, who was talking to a friend of his. He was trying to talk him out of going to back to fight in the Spanish Civil War uh, that last year when it was clear that the fascist forces were going to win. And his, the fr his friend said, I don't fight fascists uh, in French. Uh, I don't fight fascists because I'm going to win. I fight fascists because they are fascists. When I was doing my research on civil disobedience at King's College, I was talking to another researcher who researched like the uh, working class miners who went to fight against fascism in the Spanish Civil War. And, uh, you know, his, the main result of his research was, again, that people didn't go to Spain in order to beat fascism. They went to Spain because it had to be done. That's, that was the phrase. It had something had to be done and they had to do something about it. And I think, you know, for me, this is the central theme of what actually we have to do, which is to do things because they have to be done. You know, if you go down to London and sit in the road, obviously you want to get negotiations with the government and get change on climate change and what have you. But the fundamental reason why you're sitting in the road is because it has to be done. As simple as that. You know, and paradoxically, you know, my re research and experience shows that the more people who don't care about whether they win or not, the more likely you are to win because you're not so vulnerable to the outcome. I mean, it's, it's one of those weird head fuck sort of things, you know, because you just go around in circles. But it's certainly true and it's true in my experience of doing you know, various sorts of social movement work for several decades is the people that are sustainable are doing it because it's something they have to do because it's the right thing to do. And that's what sustains you over the long term, as, as you've said, Chris. So, you know, it's a major lesson, I guess. I would also add that it gives you power because people know you can't be bought off. People yeah. know that you're not going to be dissuaded through an argument about why this doesn't make sense and you know maybe you should go talk to the democratic leadership uh it gives you a kind of power um because uh they know that you're unwavering so i, I would agree totally it's kind of paradoxical that uh it, it your power comes from the point where you don't really care whether it succeeds or not that's where your power comes from so here's to doing what has to be done He's to fight an evil because it is evil and not because of assurances of victory. As always, remember who you are. 
and of life. Love people. Stay lunatic. And this is for you, Graham. And all the other Grahams out there.